Hello, everybody. This is Allison Williams here, the owner and founder of Williams Law Group, and you are watching Moving Families Forward with Williams Law Group. I want to thank you for showing up for us tonight here uh, on this wonderful Monday, this dreary day here in New Jersey. But we're going to have some fun talking to one of my favorite people about a topic that happens to be near and dear to my heart, addiction and recovery. So you might ask, why are we talking about addiction and recovery and why is it near and dear to my heart? Uh, reason is that this, this law firm really was founded uh, on the premise of helping families uh, with issues that plague them in the family court system. And what we do in this law firm is really special in that we don't just get people into a legal process and help them through a legal process, but we try to get them into the hands of people that can really help them with life issues that tend to cause legal problems. And in the family law arena, you're most likely to see that in the area of child custody uh, and certainly child abuse and neglect representation and even in divorce. Uh, so we oftentimes encounter uh, addiction issues and recovery issues and having the right professional is, is very, very important to us. So I'm gonna introduce Dr. Jerry Opdorf in just a moment. Uh, but before I do so, I just wanna give those of you that are new to our show a little cue about why we're doing this. Uh, so as I said before, Moving Families Forward was really an innovation that came out of the idea that our law firm is fundamentally different than the average family law firm. We don't just help you through your legal matter, we help you with your life circumstances and we try to focus on the family as the core of that process, the core of our society. And so as a part of helping families, we really wanted to bring resources to the families that we serve, those in our local community, those throughout the state of New Jersey, our current clients, former clients and potential clients, and our referral sources to let people know about the great resources that we've encountered in really helping our clients. And so one of those great resources that we have, as I said before, is Dr. Jerry Opdork. Uh, Dr. Jerry is with us. He has uh, over 20 years of experience in the area of counseling individuals, couples, and families. His practice is built on connection, relating to his clients as a whole, as whole people, and uh, not just the problems that they're facing. So very much in, in line with the ethos here at our law firm. Uh, he offers strategic uh, strategies rather built on his professional knowledge, uh, his expertise and his perspective that he's gained from his own life uh, challenges. So he specializes in helping individuals with um, individual counseling as well as, as well as marital counseling, sexual relationship and family issues, and addiction and recovery issues that include grief, depression, and anxiety. So a lot of the normal uh, run-of-the-mill experiences that we all have heard about, uh, he certainly is expert in those, but he also has this subspecialty in the area of addiction services. So uh, we're going to talk about that issue tonight, and I want to welcome Dr. Opthoff uh, to our show. Hi, Allison. You're smiling and you're laughing. That was a very, very, uh, that was a very benign hello, given all these words that I just got out of my mouth. Don't make me sound like the talkaholic here. It, it, it's cringeworthy because <laughs> when you say you're over 20 years, I'm like, no, I'm really not that old. And that I still think of myself as like 30. So when you <laughs> well, say you look that, I'm 30. Like, so how about that? I appreciate that very much. And please just call me Jerry. <laughs> Okay, Jerry, then I will do that. And I want to, uh, as we get started, just acknowledge that we have quite a few people that have shown up so far. So um, my good buddy, Allison Ziefert, uh, who's in the National Association of Divorce Professionals with me. Uh, we also Hi, have uh, Anna Shea of The Firm. And we have Christine Mattis, uh, uh, one of our attorney guests that has recently been on talking about special needs issues. And Michael Ringo, who is uh, a financial expert that does work with the firm as well. So uh, thank you guys for showing up. And thank you for uh, showing up. And by all means, please jump in as soon as you have a question. But with that, we're going to kick off our show tonight asking you, Jerry, about what led you to have an interest in counseling individuals. Do you want me to be serious or do you want me to be like, you know, a little humorous here? I want you um, to be <laughs> I'm going to be me. I actually got into this when I was in high school. And so I don't remember the specifics, but as a junior in high school, you had to apply to do this program as a senior. And so I applied and somehow I got picked. And so my senior year, they kind of, what we would now call probably like a peer leadership program, is they started teaching me about psychology and then eventually let me work with freshman students who we paired up with. 
Mm-hmm. So around the same time, I was going off to college and going in undecided and said, well, I'm really not good at that math thing. And English is, eh, I'm not really care for writing. This, this therapy thing sounds interesting. So I, that's how I ended up doing this. So I've been doing this since I was actually 18 years old, 17 years old. So probably over 20 years at that point. Wow. But Yep. Got into it. Loved it. Um, challenged by it in some degrees, you know, I got my bachelor's degree and said, that's it. I'm done with school. I am never going back. Had my first job, worked there about seven months, said, hmm, never going to make really any money just (laughs) with a bachelor's degree. And hence ended up going back many times for more and more education. But I truly love what I do. And so thankful I fell into it when I was in high school um, because it's probably the greatest job I, I could imagine having. Yeah, I would imagine the level of reward that you feel helping people with these issues. I mean, it's it's not for the faint of heart, but it definitely takes uh, the right character, and and that's certainly something that we've seen in you as, as thank you somebody that's done a lot of work with our firm. Well, it, it, it's it's not for the faint of heart, especially when we get into the topic of dealing with addictions, and it, it never really is. But I, I often say, like, this is the greatest job because I've learned so much from so many different individuals that I would never have been exposed to in any other job. So, you know, I meet people from all walks of life, from all situations, and it's amazing the stuff that um, I just know that I would never have had that experience if I didn't meet somebody who does project management of buildings or is a lawyer or a doctor or, you know, a a mechanic, like just all these different um, people I've met and stories. I just love it. It's so rewarding. And then to see people lives change and grow. It's it's just a it's just an overwhelming uh, experience. Yeah, absolutely. So um, before we go on to our next question, I just want to again uh, welcome everybody who's here. Uh, please do share the live uh, so that your friends, colleagues, uh, and members of your network can can learn from the topic that we're going to talk about tonight. Because it's not just personal to the people that we help, but there are a lot of uh, members of our community that are out there struggling with addiction and struggling with helping their families with addiction, which is what we're going to talk about. Uh, mm-hmm. And I definitely want as many people as possible to get the value of your expertise. So with that, let's jump right in and ask, you know, what do you say, what is the advice that you give to somebody who is battling an addiction? The, the most common advice is that there's there's always hope. There, you can always change. You don't have to continue doing the behavior or behaviors that you've been doing that are causing uh, stress not only to yourself uh, or harm to yourself, but also to the ones that you you love. And that it's it's you don't have to keep doing it. You know, there, there is a ray of hope or sunshine solution at the end. Yeah. And I would imagine a lot of people when they first encounter you uh, as an expert who's going to be helping with that topic and, and that issue in their life, they probably don't necessarily believe that. They probably are, are very steadfast in the idea that, you know, this is just how I live. Right. And, you know, I don't intend to change it. I don't know that I can change it. I don't know that I want to change it. Uh, so I'm sure you have a lot of resistance when you encounter people and you tell them, you know, you can make a different choice. Uh, a little resistance. It would be a lot of resistance. Yeah, very few people come in the door, you know, uh, willingly acknowledging they have a problem. A lot of times, people are coming in because somebody else is behind them, kind of pushing them in the door. Um, you know, and, and that's why I, I explain to people when they come in is that I'm really, and this is this may say har- sound horrible, horrible, I should say, when it comes out. But, you know, when people come in, I go, I'm not concerned about the addiction right now. You know, you're a person, you're an individual, and I want to know about you first and foremost. You know, if I met Allison Williams at a dinner party, you wouldn't come up to me and say, hey, my problem is blank. So, you know, I always start off with telling people, I want to know who you like. Do you like the Yankees or the Mets? Do you like cooking? Do you like skiing? Like, who are you? You're an individual. And if we met at a dinner party, how would you introduce yourself and talk about uh, not this problem? The other thing I tell people is, look, addiction really is, depending what addiction we're talking about, and in in the lovely intro you did, you know, I deal with alcohol and drugs and sex and gambling and pornography and video games and all these new exciting addictions we have coming uh, forth. And for most people, when no one, you know, the old commercial from the 80s is no one grows up and says they want to be an addict, and it's true. 
But what happens is we all don't deal with situations in our lives or problems in our life, no matter how great or small. And so if we use the example of alcohol, we try alcohol, it tastes horrible, but we like the effect. It makes me talk to the girl or I think I got some dance moves and I feel good. And, and then all of a sudden, as life goes on and I have problems, it kind of somewhere in the back of my mind reminds me, you know, when you had that drink, you felt a little bit better. So I have the drink, you know, and as we get older, that, that behavior becomes more and more common. There's more and more problems and, you know, that drinking always seems to make it feel better or so we believe. And then one day that problem is the drinking and that other stuff becomes, you know, lower and the drinking keeps going up and up and up. At some point, we got to deal with still down here to really deal with the drinking. And that's the message I give people is let's really talk about what's going on, what's not being dealt with. And let's see what happens with that drinking or that addiction that's going on. And what a lot of people understand is when we address the issue, that, that underlying issue, those addictions a lot of times come down to a more manageable level and then go away because now they're, they feel stronger, more capable of dealing with them. Wow. Yeah. So I, that, that definitely is true. I, I know a lot of people that have expressed that uh, it really is what's underneath that causes them uh, to drink and, and to use drugs. And once they have a better handle on themselves, it can be, um, it can, it can just make it a lot easier to start to, to eradicate that behavior. Sure. But, you know, kind of on the flip side of that, we've actually seen clients that, you know, when they start to deal with their traumas from, from childhood and from their early adulthood, they will oftentimes start to use substances as a way of medicating the pain from dealing with it. So mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people suppress things, or they suppress their issues. They don't really think about it or talk about it. And then when it starts to come up, you know, the alcohol keeps it down, the drugs keep it down. Have you ever seen people that when you start the process of treatment, it has to get worse before it gets better? Uh, yeah, I've seen it. It's come across for people. Um, you know, as you mentioned, you know, I see people for various issues, not always just addiction. So a lot of times someone might come in for marital counseling, let's say, and there's issues in the in the relationship. And all of a sudden, as that stuff comes undone, you know, they start to drink or use some substance. Um, it's not uncommon. Uh, early on in my career, dealing with trauma with people that you know, the closer they got to dealing with that core trauma, other issues would um, would arise because it's very uncomfortable to deal with that stuff. You know, we're, we are a shame-based society, as I hate to say, and so we're really uncomfortable being vulnerable and gen- gen- authentic or genuine in front of people. And so that's that other problem we're dealing with. So whether it's a traumatic event or a substance issue, we're dealing with the shame of what are people going to think? What are people, you know, going to say of me? Is this person who's sitting in front of me that's supposed to help me? Are they going to judge me? And so that's where you know it takes that time to you know get people to be authentic. Yeah, yeah. So um, definitely, that is that's one thousand percent true that we live in a shame based society. I think that's probably the most eloquent way I've ever heard that that phrase. So thank you <laughs> for sharing that. Um, let me ask you this, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, um, modalities that people use to treat addiction and Mm -hmm. at the heart of it, one of the things that I think we, we kind of glossed over that I had to, uh, excuse myself for not asking you at the, at the outset is what is an addiction? How do you define whether someone's behavior is just problematic, you know, activity on the weekend that they need to knock off versus something that truly is an impairment to the point where you'd call it an addiction? I usually keep the definition as simple as possible. So if what you're doing is causing problems in your life, you have a problem, you have an addiction, you know? So if you're, um, typically I, I, my lecture or my spiel says something like if your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your girlfriend, your neighbors, your coworkers have all kind of expressed that there's a problem with something you're doing, it's probably an addiction. Mm. You know, but the easy one is if it's causing problems in your life, you know, and whether that's financial problems, whether that's social problems, whether it's relationship problems, something that I have to look at and say, you know, this may not be normal. Yeah. So um, thank you for giving that example. I think, you know, the, the more clear we can be about what the what the problem is the easier it can be for somebody to really come to terms with the fact that they may actually have an addiction. And I know that sometimes it's just, it's hard to even 
get those words out and get those those sentiments expressed. Right, and that's what I said to you earlier on, Allison. Is that you know when people come to see me, uh, I, like I, like I said, I wouldn't meet you at a at a um, dinner party and tell you that I have blank problem. Okay, I would want to talk about what I do for a living or my hobbies, interests. It's the same thing when people come in and, and there's this hesitancy, this embarrassment, this shame about having an addiction or someone telling them they have an addiction. And I go, I don't care what term you want to use. There's a problem we want to address. And so we try to soften it a bit by saying, look, you know, a lot of times we get hung up on this word of, of addiction or addict. And it's amazing how many times I say this, this statement to clients and it really makes them think that the only people who say they're addicts are people who know they have a problem. And so, you know, but at society, you know, we have this message that if you're an addict, it's just some big boogeyman in the, you know, in the closet. But the only people that say, once again, are, that are addicts are people who know they have a problem. It's really not a bad term. It's not a bad thing to admit, you know, and I'll, I'll see people with that puzzled look on their face going, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And I'm like, right, it does. But if we watch TV, if we watch movies, you know, there's this negative, you know, stigma. And so just getting people to see that we could call it whatever you want, but you know, you have a problem. The problem's cause it's causing you a problem, you know, with what you do as a lawyer and doing family law, you know, sometimes it's easy to say to a, a husband or a father, you know, if your kids are not happy with you drinking, you know, when they're around, why would you do it? You know, it, it's really that simple. If your kids are uncomfortable with it, change that behavior. Is that really what you would want for your kids? And, you know, sometimes people can come around and see that, that, you know, when we're not labeling it, when we're, you know, taking a softer approach to it, that they can come and say, yeah, you know, would I be okay with that? You know, would I be okay with someone, you know, getting drunk and falling down in front of my kids if it wasn't me? And I'm not saying that it's okay for me to do it, just clarifying <laughs> that. But, you know, no, I wouldn't be okay with that. So why is it okay if I did it in front of my kids? you know, and getting people to, to see that. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Jerry, I just want to note that we have Deb Eileen, uh, you know, coming in and joining the conversation and she says, or how about hiding? I imagine that's in reference to the idea of what people are doing when you, when you recognize that there is a problem. So I do want to thank uh, Deb Eileen for joining us and the rest of our viewers. Uh, for those of you that are here uh, for the first time, you are watching Moving Families Forward with Williams Law Group. I am Allison Williams, the owner and founder of Williams Law Group, and we have tonight our special guest, Dr. Jerry Optoff, who is the owner and founder of the Optoff Center for Psychotherapy. And uh, Dr. Jerry does focus his practice in uh, counseling individuals, families, and marital counseling, but in particular, he has an expertise in addictions and treatment of addictions, and so that's what we're talking about tonight. So I want to now shift a little bit to talk you referenced uh, family earlier. I mean, how do you involve a family member or, or maybe multiple family members in helping to support someone who is trying to recover from an addiction? You kind of cut out there for a little bit, Allison. Can you repeat the question? Sure. Uh, the question was, how do you help family members to assist a person who is trying to recover from addiction? Um, it varies on a case-to-case -case scenario. Uh, whenever possible, it's great to have a family or family members in uh, to get that support. Um, in my practice, I offer a recovery coach who I think you've met once before who will meet with um, the spouse typically of someone I'm working with to give that family member support. It's not counseling, but just some tools, some meetings to help them um, to help them be the best person to help the loved one who's with me. If the family, if the client is able or willing to have the spouse or family in, we're going to get them in uh, involved because the more that are involved, the easier it's going to be for that client. Um, you know, sometimes clients go, listen, I don't want my family involved and they still do great work. But if we can get family members in, it's definitely, you know, more helpful, more beneficial for real long term growth. And at some point it's going to come up um, because if a person's been sober for six months, there's going to be changes in that relationship. And so at some point people get involved with it, but my door is always open. And, you know, I always encourage the client to sign releases so that I could speak to their family, should the family members call so that we can, you know, offer that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting twist to think about how do we involve families, because in the family law arena, what we often see is uh, courts like to compel the uh, family member, usually the spouse, to get some form of counseling to uh, deal with the fact that they were married to an addict. And we often get pushback on that. But I always say, you know, no one likes this phrase, but, you know, a 10 doesn't marry a two. And, you know, (laughs) For you to have been with this person that you say has been drinking persistently over the past 10 years, something was a, something was amiss in your thought process that you remained in that relationship and you obviously supported it or endorsed it or if nothing else were a benign uh, complicit uh, in the process. Yeah. And a lot of people don't want to accept that. They just want to point the blame uh, at the person who has the addiction, which is unfortunate. Right. And I agree. You know, it takes two to tango and both parties are involved in some way, shape or form. So um, Deb Eileen is uh, asking a question. She says, uh, also, do you support women whose ex-husbands are addicts? So I would imagine that really deals with kind of the, the idea of the spouse or the former spouse who really needs help to deal with the fact that they have an impaired former spouse, presumably because they have children together. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. I mean, that falls under just the general counseling of people or or therapy for people. So if someone was to come to see me because of that scenario, it would be the same thing as helping them, um, giving them tools, ideas, um, some strategies of how to handle those situations, both to make sure they're fine, uh, that their kids are fine in, in those situations. You know, most of what I do with people is really getting people to challenge their thoughts of what they think of the situation. You know, like I said, we're very shame based. We have a lot of thoughts that go on in our head, but, you know, challenging those a bit to what's really going on. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for those of you that are just stepping in, thank you for watching. You are watching Moving Families Forward with Williams Law Group. I am Allison Williams, the owner and founder of Williams Law Group. And we have with us our special guest tonight, guest tonight. Uh, Dr. Jerry Optoff, who is the owner and founder of the Optoff Center for Psychotherapy. So we're talking about addiction and recovery tonight. And for those of you that are uh, just stepping in, uh, I do want to ask that you do please share the live so that uh, people that are in your network can benefit from learning this great information that we're sharing with our community and that they can uh, benefit from the expertise of our guest. So with that, uh, Jerry, I want to turn now to talk about uh, what you do in terms of evaluating progress. Because as we know, um, some people may know, uh, we certainly know, people that have addictions can be very manipulative. You know, they learn how to hide their addiction from family members. Many times people are very functional in society. They can get up and go to work every day. They can uh, parent Mm -hmm. their kids. They know how to uh, moderate their behavior to some degree, even though it's gotten out of control. So how do you, when you're dealing with somebody, helping them with an addiction, how do you determine that someone has um, really taken the bull by the horns and addressed their problem versus somebody who may be a little less committal and you can't really, you're not, you're not with them all day or all week while they're, while they're going through their daily life. How do you evaluate if they're really making progress? Uh, It's a case by case scenario. Um, Back to what we were speaking about before, if their family members are involved, you hopefully get some feedback uh, from them. Um, In the cases of alcohol and drugs, which is predominantly what we see, I mean, I offer drug testing here. So I do urine, blood, hair, nail testing. Um, So a lot of times with clients, I'll let them know that's going to be part of this so we can see really what they're doing uh, and how often or, you know, if they're doing something, if they're not doing it in various time frames. So each one of those modalities gives us a different framework to what they're working with. Um, someone who's got a more severe problem, I might be seeing anywhere from two to three times a week and drug testing them in between. Um, someone who's less frequent, you know, once again, um, you know, they might be tested, but maybe less frequent. Um, for instance, might be doing a blood test once a month to see if they drank in a month rather than urine screens every time. Um, also, you know, if people are improving and doing well, we're going to see that change in that behavior. You know, you'll hear things of, you know, wow, I've never th- felt so clear. I've never woken up feeling so great. You know, that stress at work didn't seem as, as, um, 
large or so as overwhelming as I did weeks ago. And wow, I'm starting to realize that by not drinking or by not smoking weed or by not using drugs or whatever, that there's a, there's a little bit more clarity. Um, that's occurring in my life. So you, you get the, you know, if we need to test and see how people are doing, we have that measure. If someone's really doing well, we're going to see, you know, and hear what they're saying and see those improvements in their life, whether it's, wow, my wife and I had a date night this week and it was really great, or my kids did something and I'm so proud of them. And that's something you maybe didn't hear weeks ago. So there's that, you know, what they're saying, what they're doing, you know, you can see that change in people. It's kind of hard to describe, but you just see it. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. And, and I do want to note, uh, we have a couple of uh, new guests that have just stopped in. Rashonda Pratt, thank you for stopping in. I actually had the joy of seeing her live uh, just the other day on uh, leadership coach Judy Chung's uh, show. Uh, and my very good friend, Amy Kors, who is also a certified matrimonial law attorney, uh, she deals with these issues a lot, so I know that she uh, is tuning in because you know a lot of this stuff is probably second nature to her. But uh, I want to thank Amy for stopping in. So you know it's it's interesting, Jerry, that you talk about this idea of people um, having a change in behavior. Uh, one of the things that I think is unfortunate is that uh, when you get into the family court system, people often play games with this issue. Uh, so one party says, you know, oh yeah, you know, I've I've been taking all of the tests, I've been um, compliant with everything that's necessary. Um, and look, I have a great attendance record at work. My kids are saying that everything's fine. And then the other party comes in and says, oh no, he's sneaking drinks as soon as he drops the kids off. And, you know, he's, he's stopping at the local bar and he's been seen at, at, at the holiday party, you know, the holiday party, uh, from his job. And, you know, they drink like, uh, <laughs> like, like racehorses there. Uh, so you never really get a clear picture. And, and oftentimes the, the addict, um, parent or the addict spouse often gets demonized um, far more than they otherwise should, or sometimes they we don't we don't catch it fast enough. So, um, what do you what kinds of devices are you using? You said you do hair follicle and nail testing um, and blood screens, but I imagine you're not doing that on a weekly basis. So your analysis is kind of the more frequent test. Uh, sure. Do you have any types of um, you know spot checking where you could have somebody use a device and actually you know, on command within an hour of being tied to a device, you know, check in on whether or not they're, they're under the influence. Are you talking about like sober link with like alcohol? You use my favorite word, the S word, sober link. Yeah. Uh, so first, why don't you tell our guests what sober link is and if you use it, how you use it in helping a family? Um, sober link is awesome. Um, it is a portable breathalyzer that someone sets up an account and it has a camera to the front of it and it's all one design and so it reads their facial recognition and that person uh, blows into it at either designated times or random times and it records it and this way there is a paper trail to show that this person or parent is not under the influence at any particular time um, i have recommended it to clients um, i've had some clients use it it's phenomenal um, because it does fill in that gap, excuse me, in between. Um, I've actually recommended it to some attorneys uh, over the past year or so, saying if you have a, uh, a custody um, situation and the parent is concerned that the other uh, parent may be drinking when the kids are around, I think Soberlink is a nice uh, safety net for that other parent to feel that, okay, my child is with their uh, mother or father and that I have, you know, some security that they are taking a test and not under the influence. Um, I love it. I think it's a great, great technological advance. Yeah. So, um, Soberlink is a great tool, is a great tool. Um, and I want to now kind of follow up on something you mentioned earlier about hair versus nail testing, because mm -hmm. I only learned about nail testing as much as I've been doing this work. I've been, uh, we're in year 15 now, probably 12 of which we're really focused on people that have these issues in high volume. Right. And I only learned about nail uh, testing as an option probably about six, seven years ago. So can you tell us when you would use a nail test as opposed to a hair follicle test and why you would differentiate between the, the choice that you would apply to someone? Uh, I typically use it if someone doesn't have a lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> really is what it comes down to. Okay. So someone who doesn't have a lot of hair, 
Um, yeah, okay, fine. We'll take the nail, nail test. Um, it, it's usually how I use the, the distinction. Um, I, 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 with the hair test, you know, obviously we could take patches of um, samples of hair from the back of someone's head. Um, you can use bodily hair also. And that's where I'm like, I really don't need to get someone's <laughs> armpit hair. Yeah. I'm going to be honest here. I don't need <laughs> armpit we'll hair. Going don't... into the armpits, right. we're going to just yank your nails. Exactly. So the nails uh, are just as effective and actually quite easier. I, I find them actually easier than the hair test because I, I found this out. You don't realize how unsteady your hand is until you're cutting someone's hair. <laughs> And I do have this fear of like, I don't want someone to have a big bald spot on the back of their head because I went, oops. So um, it's not as easy as it sounds. The nail clipping is are a lot easier. <laughs> but they're just well, as reliable. Point well taken. So and they measure you the same. You wanted me to be honest, Allison. I, I did. I wanted to hear about the armpits. I just have, had to work that way in. You know, Jerry and I were talking before the show and we said we got to get that word in there somehow. <laughs> armpits was the name of the game for tonight. That was it. Uh, so in all seriousness, there is there really no distinction between the volume of a substance that you can detect in a hair follicle as opposed to a nail? Is it really equivalent or is there any distinction at all? Uh, the, re the research says it's, it's fairly uh, equivalent. You know, you're getting a number, you know, uh, of someone using a substance. And really, when we're talking about illegal, um, illicit substances, the number per se doesn't really matter as, oh, there's cocaine in the system. Oh, the spouse has been doing cocaine you know, uh, or THC, you know, the opiates become obviously a little bit trickier because if someone is medically prescribed them, you know, that can be, um, a little bit trickier as far as, you know, them testing positive and the number that's associated with the drug test. But at the end of the day, if they're legally taking it, they have a prescription from their doctors filled at CVS. We have a paper trail to show that the person wasn't really abusing it. Yeah. So that is an interesting question that uh, or issue that you brought up, this idea of opiates, because we have a lot of cases where a, a legally prescribed substance will be allegedly abused and mm -hmm. a party will have a lot of difficulty in trying to show that the amount that is in the system exceeds the amount that one would have expected to be there, but for the fact that um, the person was abusing. And mm -hmm. so um, in that instance, would you go to a hair follicle or nail testing as opposed to a blood test or, or maybe even a urine screen for something like that? Like for Honestly, for something like that, I like the urine screens. Um, there's uh, two different laboratories that I've used um, over the last several years. And the nice thing is with the urine screen is it'll show the obvious, the amount that's in the urine. And I can usually call the laboratory and say, okay, this person tested positive for whatever substance, and it's this amount of nanograms per milliliter, and I don't want to bore everyone here with the, all the little scientific details. But I can usually get a sense from them saying, okay, so would somebody using this 10 milligram, 10 milligram uh, painkiller, what would that number that showed up on the blood, um, I'm sorry, in the urine test, what would it show us? Is this someone who's using it frequently? Is it someone who's, you know, abusing it? So I can usually get a, a almost a, actually a better reading from the lab sometimes than with the hair and nail test. Ah, okay. So when you're using labs, I, I presume you're going to incorporate the information that you got from the lab in any type of report that you would be generating for the court. Correct. So depending on who the person is, so if someone's seeing me um, on their own, and there's no legal issue, we'll use the, you know, the in-house urine screens typically. Um, if it's somebody who's got a legal case going on, whether it's DIFUS, a divorce, we'll typically go to the labs because we get that nice you know, breakdown of what actually is in their system. Um, the lab test can test up to like, I wanna say 55, 60 different substances, both legal and illegal, so we really get a sense of what's going on with someone. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm glad that you mentioned that you have on-site urine screens because uh, for any person that we try to refer um, to some type of treatment, sometimes we will make a recommendation for treatment and we'll say, you know, listen, if you don't believe there's a problem, still go, uh, go talk to somebody. And if there's no problem, then great. You know, there's no problem. But if there is a problem, you're getting it solved. If there's not a problem. You've got documentation that you can use proactively to prevent uh, the other side from making a claim against you in family court. Right. Uh, so a service like yours is very valuable, but 
I want to shift now and talk a little bit about I, I, if I could interrupt Allison. Sure. I've said the same thing to some of my clients that have had allegations in the past that something like Soberlink, buy it, have it, take it on your own. No one has to know about it. But then you have a paper trail. So if there's ever an allegation, you have something, you know, to say, nope, I've got something that shows it was me and I've been taking these tests. So if you have nothing to hide, take the tests. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that is such a powerful piece of advice coming from a sub from a mental health professional, because uh, I'm sure you've been called into cases before where yes. it's really hard to prove that somebody did not have a problem before a date certain. So you show up and start, quote, treating. And the argument is, all right, well, yes, he got treatment on the eve of our custody evaluation. Uh, <laughs> however, <laughs> he's been habitually using this substance over the past six years, and and uh, we don't necessarily uh, believe that the problem has been solved. Right. Uh, so with that, uh, one of my very good friends has now shown up, Scott Gorman, uh, attorney Scott Gorman from Hackensack. He's, yeah, I see Jerry smiling, so yeah, Hi, he, knows, he knows that name and he knows that face. So. Uh, I'm going to introduce Scott, uh, or I'm going to introduce Scott's question in just a moment. But for those of you that are just showing up to the live, thank you for being here. You are watching Moving Families Forward with Williams Law Group. I am Allison Williams, the owner and founder of Williams Law Group. And we're talking tonight to our great guest, Jerry Opthoff, who uh, is an addiction specialist and founder of the Opthoff Center for Psychotherapy. So uh, for those of you that are just tuning in, please do share the live so that other people will get a chance to learn a lot about our topic of tonight, which is addiction and recovery. And for my good friend, Scott, that just popped in to uh, joust his good buddy, Jerry, uh, the question that Scott asks is, would a urine screen from a lab that you use do a better job of distinguishing a substance like Suboxone from heroin or Oxy? Yes. <laughs> All righty then. Thank you for that very detailed and elaborate answer. Um, yeah, uh, the one of the labs that I use, Millennium Lab, is fairly good with that. Um, some of the opiate uh, prescription drugs, sometimes they can't say, well, it's it's oxycodone or oxycotton, um, but they can, you know, relatively uh, get as close as po possible. But Suboxone, um, they could definitely tell the difference too. There we go. So thank you, Scott, for throwing that question out Thanks, there. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Um, so let's talk a little bit about evaluations. So sure. a person like me, a family law attorney, would probably come to you and say, okay, I've got a client who allegedly has a problem, uh, and I want an evaluation that I can use in court mm -hmm. to be able to uh, distill the idea that he or she has a problem and um, that, that I can use basically on the offense or even perhaps on the defense. So Tell me about your process for creating and conducting a substance abuse evaluation, what that looks like, what that it, what's entailed for the, the subject, as well as how you would work with attorneys doing that. Sure. Um, typically, how that process works is roughly we're talking about six to eight sessions is what I let people know off, you know, from the beginning. And that's going to involve individual sessions with me. Um, it'll include some form of uh, drug testing or alcohol testing. Uh, so whether we, like we said, it's the instant test, it goes out to a lab, it's a blood spot test, uh, the hair, the nails, there's going to be something, if not all, or some combination of those. Um, there'll be meetings with me. There's some homework that I give clients to fill out. I give them a pretty large packet to fill out. It's about eh, 12 to 14 pages long. And so, you know, seeing how responsive they are to answering it, see their answers to that, I'll go over it with them, um, as well as I'll do a biopsychosocial with them uh, over the course of those sessions to really get to know who they are, to um, know who they are, what their what issues there may be besides substance abuse issues. Uh, there are some paper and pen tests that I will give them also over those course of sessions. And as I explained to them, the reason for the paper and pen test, it's very easy for an individual like myself or anybody for that matter to say, and no offense, Allison, uh, women who wear blue shirts with white flowers on it must have alcoholism. <laughs> and I could easily write that because that's just my feeling that by the paper and pen test and the, and the urine screens of the blood spot test really gives me more credible evidence to make an argument whether someone does or doesn't have a problem because it's it's their answers and it's in my opinion it's more concrete and it gives me um 
just more leverage there to say this is why. So that when lovely people like Allison or Scott make me testify in court, I can safely say this is how I I feel or how I came, I shouldn't say I feel, how I came to this conclusion because of the, this information. Now, Jerry, let me just interject here. When you say a paper and ten, pen test, are you talking about something like the mass, the Michigan alcohol screening test and the, the SASE and some Very of those good, other? Yes. Okay. Um, and so for, for those of uh, our viewers who are not familiar with those tests, there are a number of quantitative tests that uh, are, are good and reliable and used as a standard of measure uh, in a particular discipline. So with with, with alcohol uh, and even with other forms of substances, there are screen screening tests that are used to get uh, self-report data that can be used uh, to help uh, assess whether somebody has a problem. But one of the things that we've seen a lot of, Amy and I, uh, in the family court arena, and I'm sure Scott, you've seen it too in the in the criminal defense world, is, you know, there's always the argument that this person has manipulated their answers because they knew what to say. Uh, because it's not hard to avoid answering certain questions in a certain way. You know, how many times have you blacked out in the past, you know, six months uh, from drinking alcohol? If I'm accused of being an alcoholic, my answer would be zero. Uh, if someone is asking me, you know, how many times have you um, had a blackout? Uh, or how many times have you driven under the influence of alcohol? And I'm being accused of having an alcohol problem, my answer is gonna be zero. So do you ever have a third party who uh, may have a relationship with the subject, but perhaps not necessarily a friendship or perhaps not necessarily somebody who would have a reason to support uh, the subject to actually come in and, and give their perspective on whether the answers are accurate so that when you're assessing the person, you get a, a clearer read, a more objective read than just self-report data? Um, yes. I mean, once again, it's, it's kind of hard. It's a case by case scenario. It, ideally, and I, I left this out it, in some legal cases, I get the reports from the courts, um, or from the opposition saying, here's all the stuff that we, we've submitted as evidence to why person a has a problem. And obviously I'm reviewing that. And in those individual sessions with that person, I'm going to be asking them questions about that and comparing it to what their answers are on those tests. You know, the reason I, I tell people that the assessment typically takes six to eight sessions um, and it can be longer. And some of those six sessions or eight sessions might be two hours long is because anyone can hold it together for one or two sessions. All right. So if I come into your office, Allison William is the great substance abuse counselor I have to see. And Allison says, do you have a drinking problem? And I go, no. <laughs> and have you ever drove drunk? Never. Of course, I'm going to say that. But over the course of six, eight sessions and meeting with people and looking at the answers on those tests and getting collaborative information, I mean, a lot of times I will meet, um, in the case of family law, I'll meet with the spouse or the ex-spouse or soon-to-be ex-spouse and hear their side of things and take notes and then go back and, you know, challenge the person with those. Um, so that's what I'm saying, you know, th one or two sessions, I can hold it together. Six, eight sessions, I'm going to start seeing cracks in that that story that don't make sense. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's where the paper and pen tests and the drug screens and other interviews, reviewing documents from the courts really help to go, okay, what's really going on here? Yeah, that's a very good point, Jerry. And one of the things I would add to that is that, you know, there are a lot of people that are not being inherently deceptive. They really have tricked themselves into believing there's not a problem. And the very fact that they're being accused by someone they may be estranged from, like their former spouse, uh, can oftentimes make them that much more entrenched in the idea that there's not a problem. In fact, I remember one time we had a, a client who was accused of domestic violence. And I started asking him questions about what his wife would say was the nature of the problem. And he said, well, my wife is going to say I'm an alcoholic. And I said, all right, well, do you, dis do you agree or disagree? And he said, I disagree. And so I started going through what was the routine. And the routine ended up being I leave work every day, I go by a bar, um, I have a couple of drinks, and then I go home. And I said, well, that's not inherently problematic, but let's talk about what those drinks are. And those drinks went from being, you know, what we would think of as a drink to being, you know, this size, 99% uh, of which was alcohol with just a little top off of Coke, two of those, which were really about five drinks uh, aggregate. Uh, right. And then you head home 
and then you have another couple of drinks. And then when you start adding it all up, um, he was drinking about seven to eight drinks a night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was changing his behavior, impacting his marriage, impacting his parenting, uh, affecting his memory. Clearly, there was a problem there. But, you know, just confronting somebody with, are you uh, right. an addict, was never effective. And really, just through asking some strategic questions, you help people to see themselves in a different way. Sure. And, you know, you mentioned some of those uh, paper and pen tests before, you know, a lot of them question or or look at is someone defensive. And I do, I want, I hate to say it, I kind of want people to be defensive when they take them, especially when they're coming from a lawyer's office. Because if you come into, you know, if a lawyer is referring you to me to do an evaluation and you're not defensive, again, in itself says, well, did you lie? Because what I normally see is on the defensive scales, they go skyrocketing. Yeah, because I didn't ask to be here. I didn't ask to go through all of this. But my ex is making me do all this because that person is making all these accusations. There should be a level defensiveness. So sometimes what's considered negative is actually a positive thing to say, okay, this person's responses are are, um, appropriate. You know, because if they're trying to paint this ideal calm person, I think that might give more of a sense that they're lying. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we actually have quite a few comments that have come in. I want to just acknowledge my friend, Dr. Carla Cook is on. Uh, She's a psychologist and she notes that she definitely wants documentation when doing a psychological evaluation. So good good ups to you that you're actually going to do more than just talk to the person. Uh, And my good friend, Amy Coors, a family law attorney, raised a, a couple of questions that I'll just read her comments to you. Uh, she says, how many times have you been fired from a job? Zero. What do you do as the evaluator when you're presented with proof that this is not accurate? And what do you do when you're the therapist? How do you, um, how do you deal with that? You know, and you know, she just kind of raises that. She said it's food for thought, but I actually would like to hear your response on that. You know, when you have somebody giving you information that clearly is contradicted by data uh, extraneous to them, um, what do you do with that information in terms of rendering a final report as an evaluator or rendering therapy uh, if that is your role? Well, as an evaluator, if the person's sticking to that story despite the evidence, it's going to be reflected in the report. Uh, and, and that's going to come out of that, you know, in let's say employment history, you know, Mr. Smith, you know, on numerous occasions of our meeting talked about never being fired from a job, despite evidence to the contrary. When I spoke to Mr. Smith about this evidence, uh, he adamantly denied that it was true, you know, so that's going to get worked in into uh, that situation if it's an evaluation. As a therapist, it's a little bit more different of, of approach. Um, where I might be more confrontational with them. So if someone's coming in on their own um, for a problem, and but I have this information, you know, someone anonymously left it on the phone call or the, the voicemail or an email, you know, at some point I might say, well, what's the point of all this? Like, why are you lying to me? If you're here to get help and you want me to help you, we got to be open. We got to be honest. And if you're not going to be, this isn't going to work. So... Two different scenarios there. Very good points. And uh, we have some more people on the line uh, or watching us today. Uh, We have Karen Simmons who says hello. So Karen, hello. Uh, And we also have Anna Shea of our office. And she says, thanks for the (laughs) insight into how you're able to fully assess your patient and how you can see the forest from the trees. It is comforting to know that as a professional, you're able to see through the mirage and to truly treat the issues. And um, that is definitely 1000% correct. Uh, For those that are just tuning in, I will again remind you, you are watching Moving Families Forward with Williams Law Group. I am Allison Williams, the founder of Williams Law Group, and I have tonight our good friend Jerry Optoff, friend of the firm and uh, mental health professional to the stars, founder and owner of (laughs) Optoff Center of Psychotherapy. So let's circle around now and talk about this idea of support, Uh, because when people are dealing with an addiction, obviously... Uh, It's a difficult time for the individual. It's a difficult time for the family. What types of services do you have at Optoff Center for Psychotherapy where um, people can get support? Do you have support groups? Do you have just individual counseling for addictions? How do you treat the issue? Um, Actually, uh, all the above. Um, So as we mentioned earlier on, you know, the recovery coach who will work with with family members if uh, everyone's on board. Uh, But doing the individual, doing the couples therapy, I do offer some groups here. So there's a what I call a recovery group. 
So an individual who comes in um, either on their own or through lawyers or the court system, uh, there's a group for people that um, are early in the stages. And typically how that group would work is they would see me individually once a week and then they would attend group once a week. Um, how I explain to people is what we talk about in group is going to be brought in individual and what's talked about in individual comes out in group. And I have to say it works wonderfully because people know there, there's this complete transparency. So if you if Allison and I are talking on Thursday, groups typically Monday nights. Um, if Allison and I are talking on Thursday and she's like, you know, I really have a problem with Anna Shea and what she said to me in group on Monday, who does she think she is? We're going to process that. But Allison's going to know on Monday when we're sitting around in group, I'm going to say, Allison, do you have anything you want to say? And if Allison says no, I'm going to say, you sure? Because I'll be the one then to say, <laughs> you said you had a problem with what Anna said last week. How do you want to handle this? Uh -oh. You know, so it gets people You're to the instigator. <laughs> no, I'm the therapist. <laughs> but it's you know we want to break down those walls. We want to let people you know confront things in a safe and healthy environment. You know, and if they can learn to share their likes and dislikes with people, the better that's going to be when they can take that out into the rest of the world. Um, but I also run an anger management group, which runs for about six to eight weeks as well. Um, and that's just more just group therapy, dealing with anger issues predominantly, um, have at times a betrayal, uh, group for women. So women who are struggling with being betrayed and that's a very broad sense. Um, but years ago came to this realization that a lot of times I'm seeing a lot of men and the husband or the boyfriends in therapy because of a divorce or a legal matter and the loved ones over there. That's their problem. And they've been kind of left alone in all of this. And it really came out of reading uh, Robert Weiss's work on sexual addiction. And that when we talk about sex addiction and pornography, that there's a partner that's involved in this who's been betrayed. And that person's usually left hanging out. Well, I'm the addict. I have a problem. And that, um, that spouse is kind of left with that shame and guilt. You know, when we talk about sex addiction and pornography, in, in a lot of ways, that's a lot more stressful for the partner because to go forward and say, oh, my husband has a drinking problem, people will rally around you and say, oh, yeah, my father, my boyfriend, somebody had it. You know, as, as a, a woman, and please, Allison, you know, we've known each other long enough. If I'm wrong with this, please correct me. But if you have to say that your husband or significant other has a sexual addiction, the feeling is what? People are going to look at what's wrong with Allison. Right. And so here's, you know, where women are left with this, this burden. So not only have I been betrayed by my significant other, but I really can't turn to anyone, my family, my friends, because most likely they're going to look at me. Um, I had a case where uh, the husband had a sexual addiction and the wife said, like, I can't tell people um, the, the gentleman had a, an addiction to uh, pornography. OK, nothing illegal under that age group. Um, but even the wife said, she goes, I can't tell anyone because my husband's a coach. And if I tell people he's a sex addict and looking at pornography, they're automatically going to think he's looking at child pornography. And right. so, you know, all that burden that she was carrying, let alone the betrayal she felt from her husband. Well, that's you a know. great point. You know, we, we've seen cases with sex addiction here at the firm. And one of the things that is probably the hardest is for the partner to believe it's a real addiction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as oh, you I'll give examples. It, and yeah, right. As you defined it earlier, you know, it really is any type of habitual behavior that's impairing your life in some way. And so what ends up happening is, you know, the kind of uh, stereotypical boys will be boys. This is just male behavior. You know, he just needs to learn to keep it in his pants. He has low integrity comes out as the answer. And the person who says, no, 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 this is an addiction. This is something that is habitual uh, that he really can't stop himself because of, um, you know, his own, you know, processing of this mm -hmm. issue. It becomes much harder to accept. It becomes harder for the partner to accept. And you're right, people do blame the partner and they will oftentimes blame the partner for not leaving the addict spouse uh, in a situation where a lot of times they would not blame you if you were choosing to stand by your alcoholic spouse or your uh, drug addict spouse. So it's a, it's a right. definitely, it's a very um, unique classification of addictive behavior and it oftentimes causes 
more upheaval than than not for uh, the partners. Correct. So um, I want to just note that Christine Mattis uh, uh, has a question. She says she may have missed this, but do you help teens and young adults? Is that an area of expertise that you have? I do. I, I usually see people from the age of like 15 and up. Um, I, it's not a big part of my practice, but I have, I'm prior to going full-time into private practice, I actually did work in the school systems for many years. Um, so I'm very comfortable working with teens as well and young adults. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Christine, for, for highlighting that. Um, Jerry, I want to ask you, since, since Christine raised this issue, how do you, how do you, uh, counsel a teen dealing with an addiction, if, if, if at all, in a way that might be different than dealing with an adult? You know, clearly you've got you've got some developmental differences. Uh, there's a different frame of reference in terms of life, different levels of accountability and responsibility. How do you how do you differentiate how you would address a problem, uh, an addiction with an adult uh, versus a teenager? I would say the the big difference is that adolescents that I've seen that have problems, it typically surrounds like marijuana, uh, is the big one, and so treating that. Uh, is a little bit different because of the immaturity and the brain development and that God put it on this earth and it's natural. And so what's the big deal? Um, and it's, it's, so it's kind of, it's doing the same work. It's a little bit, you know, coming that where they are. So with a lot of the times with adolescents, I'll say, okay, so alcohol is legal, but people have problems with alcohol. So just because weed is here because God planted it, I'll also point out that God planted all the other drugs also, but because <laughs> you have to do more work with those, that there's some distinction with adolescents yeah. that, you know, it's the same thing. Like, what's it matter if it's, you know, grown on the earth or it's something on the internet? If it's a problem, it's a problem. Um, a lot of times though, seeing adolescents, that's where we talk about getting the family involved. Because a lot of times it's the family's reaction to things or the mixed messages they're getting, you know, the kids are getting at home. So with seeing teenagers, you really got to get the families involved. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned marijuana as kind of the, the, the drug of choice or the, the most common problem that you see with teens. One of the things that uh, Scott Gorman, who was on our show uh, and, and stopped in to harangue you a little while ago, uh, <laughs> we talked about marijuana DUIs and the fact that marijuana now that it we're very close to it appears it becoming legal yes uh, i think a lot of people in addiction services are going to have a real difficulty um not necessarily in treating it but in evaluating where the problem lies because with alcohol you have an objective measure we've identified the the rate at which uh anything more we consider that to be legally intoxicated you can identify, uh, you can take a test, you can do a breathalyzer, you know, you've got the, the ALCO test, you've got the interlock devices, you've got something that you can say, this quantitative test is gonna be the basis to say you have a problem. But with marijuana, you know, what are we gonna measure? How many bags of Cheetos you had? Uh, how slow you're driving your car? You know, we don't really have a standard yet. And, how long you laugh at a movie. Yeah, there you go. You know, if you if you think uh, if you think a lot of things out there are funny, then perhaps that that might <laughs> that might be your basis. But you know, I don't I don't know if this is something that you've actually had to face this this idea of uh, not physically addictive but physiologically addictive, uh, and maybe um, having to come up with a different standard of measure to determine whether or not marijuana use has impaired someone's life. How how do you how do you deal with that in an evaluation context? Well, with regards to what uh, you and Scott were talking about with DUIs, it's my understanding that one of the things that the, the, the governor is looking at is a, actually an oral test for the police departments to use. So it would almost be a mouth swab, which would show more recent use rather than a urine test, which could be, you know, two weeks to six months worth of use there right. um, is how I understand that th th their thinking behind it. Obviously, you know, we're doing a lot of research when it comes to what Colorado, California, Oregon have done and where the mistakes have lied. Um, it's it's the same thing of, you know, just trying to assess what a normal range is. I've had a couple in the last couple of weeks, uh, clients who have medicinal marijuana and, you know, putting that through that filter and saying, OK, how is this, you know, is this really a problem with this individual or is it medically being used? 
you know, um, I have both positive stories from that and negative stories from that. Um, because I did have someone who was getting over, you know, on the medical marijuana. And so there, there are those loopholes, um, when you can have the family involved, when you can have as many people and as much information and in, involved in the situation, it really can minimize that issue. Yeah, absolutely. But I think a whole new can of worms. Luckily, New Jersey is not going to be the first state. So like I said, we've seen what Colorado's made mistakes. We've seen California. You know, I'll, t I'll ask you this as a family lawyer. Do you know what the biggest increase uh, of problems was with marijuana in Colorado within the first year? I would imagine the smell. <laughs> <laughs> no. You're walking down the street, you get that contact high. No, no, I don't know what the problems would be in Colorado. They had a significant increase, and I can't, uh, I, I don't remember the percentage offhand, so I'm not going to quote a number I'll be wrong on. But in two areas, they had a significant amount of increases uh, for a problem related to the use of marijuana. And it was the, um, the admittance of emergency room visits at animal hospitals and children to hospital emergency rooms. Uh-oh. Right. What was it? Setting the cat on fire? <laughs> no, it was the edibles. Oh. Because people would leave those out. People would leave out pot brownies and the, the kids. And the gummies. And the, <laughs> and the kids and the cats would eat those. And so they had, within the first year, uh, the largest increase in emergency room visits for those two populations. So no one expected that to be one of the problems that came about that all of a sudden now people were leaving their, their edibles around. Yeah, that's um, shockingly quite disturbing to hear. It's disturbing. When I first heard it, it was very disturbing to hear. But then you sit there and go, it makes absolutely complete sense that people would just be comfortable. Well, yeah. You know, I'm and mellow, so I'm going to leave out my brownies and... It's legal and I could have my... Um, actually, there was a TV show last year... Um, man with a plan. I had to think about it. My wife and I watched the show, and the joke was the grandfather had his bowl of gummy bears, <laughs> and the other son, who was straight laced, was eating them, and then all of a sudden started hallucinating. <laughs> Good well, those are my gummy bears. Yeah. So you know, for someone who's doing family law, I would expect you're going to see some of that coming up. You know, with the legalization. All right, guys. So you heard it here first. Dr. Jerry is warning all of us family law attorneys to be on the lookout for those gummy bears and brownies <laughs> with a little something extra as an, an extra ingredient. Mm -hmm. uh, and so with that, I do want to thank you all. We are at the top of the hour for our show. Wow. Today. Uh, I do want to thank you all for watching. Uh, we got a lot of value out of uh, Dr. Othoff's commentary about recovery and addiction and how we deal with that issue, how he deals with that issue. Uh, I know that he has been a great resource to us here at the firm. He has helped a lot of people. Uh, we've connected him with a lot of other firms as well. We just really believe in the value of what he does, and he does it very professionally. So if you want to get a hold of Dr. Jerry, um, Jerry, how do, you, how do you recommend that people get a hold of you if they either need help with an evaluation or treatment of an addiction issue? Well, people can always email me at, uh, at my email, which is Dr. Optoff at Optoff Psychotherapy. Um, if you go to optoffpsychotherapy.com is my website, you can message me through that. But obviously, I also have a Facebook page, a Twitter account. Uh, I think there's an Instagram account. Um, <laughs> some social media I I'm on. Um, so people could always email me any questions on any of those. Uh, people can call me um, at my office. Um, if you want me to give you out the number, I don't know how you do this. We will uh, drop your contact information into the comments. So for anybody that wants to get a thanks. hold of you, they will have your email, your, um, your website URL. And we're not going to put all the social media links out there, but I believe that those are probably on your website. So yes. they can get a hold of you there as well. Yes. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. I, I, I love answering these things. So again, thank you all for watching our show tonight. You have been watching Moving Families Forward with Williams Law Group. I am Allison Williams, the founder and owner of Williams Law Group. We want to again thank our guest, Dr. Jerry Optop. And thank you for watching. Have a great night. Thank you, Allison, as well.